Okay. Good morning and welcome back everybody to our course on Revelation and Daniel BC 308. We are looking, uh, we just started uh, the book of uh, Revelation and uh, we are continuing now. We are looking at Revelation chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 and um, we are uh, uh, we've just made a few comments uh, from verse 1 and we had uh, just stated about the word angel uh, that that word angel could be used to talk about uh, the word angel simply means uh, angelos simply means messenger and therefore the the messenger could be an angelic messenger could be um, a human messenger in, in other places it's also used for false messengers or um, uh, people who uh, who are not true messengers so we depending on the the context where it is used we must interpret the word messenger or the word angel or angelos to mean you know the the appropriate whether it's an angelic being or a human messenger and so on so we move on to verse 2 revelation 1 verse 2 so John is saying that he is bearing witness. That means he's saying, look, I am recording what the Lord has shown me. Uh, and he says, this is the word of God, you know, verse 2. So John is very, you know, what he is telling us is, look, I am telling you the word of God. That's verse 2. It's very significant. So I'm not telling you some fancy or you know fanciful things that I imaginations or things that I came up with some fiction. No, no, no. I'm telling you the word of God, the words that God spoke to me. That's that. There's a reverence, uh, you know, to this whole thing. It's the word of God. So I'm a witness to this. I'm. I am telling you. I'm bearing record. To the word of God, then he says, to the testimony of Jesus, that means to what Jesus testified, what Jesus spoke. And this phrase, the testimony of Jesus, is again a phrase which I think is very interesting to trace through the book of Revelation. It is used, uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is used to talk about what Jesus himself speaks. And it's also used to what people speak about Jesus. Example, Revelation 12, it talks about the people who have the word of God and the testament. They are speaking and about Jesus Christ. And I'm looking at um, Revelation 12, verse uh, 17 it is it is the, the the phrase testimony of jesus christ is used to what people that means these in this case it's jewish believers um, people who believe what they are saying about jesus and it's also used in revelation 19 verse 10 uh, uh, if that same phrase testimony of jesus to talk about Revelation 19.10, to talk about what the Holy Spirit is speaking about Jesus. So, the phrase, testimony of Jesus Christ, is used in these three different ways in the book of Revelation. And John is saying, I am bearing witness to the word of God. That means I am recording for you the word of God. And what Jesus has spoken, the testimony of what Jesus has given to me. And he says in verse 2, and the things that he saw. There's a first hand account. I saw these things. Of course, these are spiritual visions or things in the spiritual realm. He says, I saw these things and I recorded. Now, this is again something we learned in 
hermeneutics. That is, the, the writings are inspired or revealed, that means God reveals, but they are captured in the language and in the context of the writer. So John says, I saw these things, I have recorded. So, which means that, especially in the book of Revelation, because God is revealing things to John way ahead of time, but John is recording it in his context, that means in the using the language and using you know whatever knowledge he has, you know, for him to relate to what he is saying. He records it in his language and in his context. So he will use. The, the best he can to record what he is saying. So example, uh, and, and I think I, I used the same example earlier um, in, in our course on the end times. I said, you know, just example is, how would John in 1895 report about or record what he sees if he were to see a mobile phone. Okay, so he's looking ahead in time. And that's a simple example. He's looking ahead in time and he's seeing a mobile phone. But he has to record what he sees in his day, in his time. He has no context for it. That means there is no mobile phone. He doesn't even know what that is. So he may record it like, uh, I see a, you know, a, a rectangle piece of whatever material or, you know, a, a shiny material that can speak. So, you know, because the phone has sound and voice, say it, I can hear it speak and speak you know, make sound. Uh, it can also listen, maybe. Uh, it can also, it has an eye through which it takes pictures. You know? So I'm just trying to think, you know, how would he record, or how would he write down if he were to see a mobile phone? He has to use his language and he has to use pictures that he is familiar with or language that he's familiar with. But he's seeing, you know, 2000 years into the future and he has to record what he sees in his context. And then we come along 2000 years later, we are reading what John has recorded. But he's recorded it in his language or in, in his with what he has understood. But to us, it is something we can relate to. Like, yeah, of course, this, this kind of represents something we have a mobile phone example. I'm just giving an example. Okay, I'm not saying that's what he did. I'm just giving an example. That means we, are, we read what he wrote and then we have to translate it to our day and time and see, you know, if it matches, makes sense, or it could be something that already happened in the past, or it could be something that's going to happen in the future. But we need to, you know, take what he said using his language and try to understand it according to our day and time. And in some cases, we may be able to say, yeah, that, that is a mobile phone. Oh yeah, that, 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 that's something we can understand. Oh yeah, it, it's actually something that we do have. But he recorded it in terms like, you know, a rectangle, piece of stone that had a voice uh, that could sing or make music and that could had one eye or three eyes whatever or eyes on both sides depending on the, you know what kind of phone he saw and uh, that was able to see in front and behind and uh, whatever you know things like that
And of course, God would only highlight certain parts of that whole phone. So he may not know all the apps that are inside the phone. He would just describe what he saw. Okay, I'm just giving example, and I'm not saying that's what he did. He, he didn't see a mobile phone. There's no record of a mobile phone. I'm just giving example. So going back to verse two, John is saying, I personally recorded this. It is the word of God. It is what Jesus Christ spoke, and it is what I saw. Meaning there is seriousness to this whole thing. God's word, Jesus spoke, I saw. That's what I recorded. Okay, so we should take the book of Revelation very seriously uh, because it's, it comes with such um, weight, with such reverence. Verse 3. So then he says, verse 3, blessed is the one who reads it. You know, there's a blessing in reading this book, in listening to its words, and in obeying it. So obviously, there has to be some sort of an understanding implied, because uh, otherwise, you know, how can you obey or how can you follow through uh, with, you know, with uh, uh, action in our lives? If this book doesn't make sense. So what I want to say is sometimes you hear people saying, hey, I, I, I you know, they, and, and I've heard this, oh, I don't read the book of Revelation at all. Why? It's too difficult to understand. And it has all these strange pictures and strange things happening, and I don't like it. No, we should change our attitude. We should say, look, this is the word of God. This is what Jesus Christ spoke. John saw it, he recorded it, and there's a blessing in reading it, listening to it, understanding it, so that we can let it then therefore affect the way we live, obey, it do, do something in relation to it. There's a blessing in there. And implicit there is God will give us understanding because only then we can obey. How can you obey something that doesn't make sense? That is something you know, you think it's strange. So our attitude towards the book of Revelation should be, it's given to me to bless me. It's given to me because God does want me to hear it. And it's given to me because God does want me to understand so that I can then follow through with a life of obedience to God. Okay, so the book of Revelation Yes, it is given to us in, you know, in a lot of things are in prophetic imagery, but it is meant to be received. It's meant, meant to be understood and it's meant to bless our lives. That's our approach to this book. Okay, so let's get in now to um, verses four through six, please. Verses 4 through 6, chapter 1. Somebody could read that. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits of, who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. And the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loves, loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So verses 4 through 6, of course, is the introduction. And John is saying to whom he is writing or he's bringing the message and from whom. Right? So to whom he says to the seven churches which are in Asia. So we saw these were seven churches that were all located on the western side of modern day Turkey. They were all close to each other. John is on the island of Patmos. He probably was providing leadership before he was banished and this church has looked up to him, so he had some sense, some place of uh, authority, spiritual authority and leadership for these churches. 
And of course, they all recognized him as the last living apostle of the Lord uh, at that time. And uh, so he's writing to them. I'm writing to the seven churches. But then he says, grace to you and peace from. So he's telling us, whom is he writing from? And he says, and he uses the word from three times in these, uh, in verse four, four to six, from, three times. So then immediately we understand, he's talking about, he's going to, he's saying from God the Father, from the Holy Spirit, from the Lord Jesus Christ, from. So very clearly you see in verse four, grace to you and peace from him, God the Father. And what does he say about God the Father? Who is and who was and who is to come. I think this God is eternal God. From the eternal God. He was, he is, he is, he was, he is to come. And he, he's always been there, eternity past. He'll always continue to be there. From him. Who is, who was, who is to come. God the Father and from so now he's identifying someone else and from who is he talking about the seven spirits who are before his throne now this gets very confusing excuse me who are the seven spirits before his throne well we now have to interpret this because we understand from the rest of the bible that is god the father God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, because in the next verse, verse 5, he says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn. So the third from is from Jesus Christ. Therefore, the second from has to refer to the Holy Spirit. The first from is referencing God the Father. From him who is, who was, who is to come. And from, second from, the seven spirits which are before his throne. Third from, and from Jesus Christ. Okay. You understood the first from is God the Father. We understood the third from is Jesus Christ. It's very explicit, so no doubt. So therefore, the second from has to talk about the Holy Spirit. Except that, He's saying something very different. He's saying, from the seven spirits who are before his throne. That puts us off, meaning it's confusing. But then that's where we say, okay, are there seven spirits or is there one spirit? We know. Right? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I think it is, it tells us that there is one spirit, one one Lord, one faith, one. Um, uh, uh, Ephesians four four, there is one body and one spirit. Right, Ephesians four four. So there's only one spirit, one Holy Spirit, not seven. So then we have to say, okay, we cannot say. Or we should, let me put it like this. When he says from the seven spirits who are before his throne that is referring to the one holy spirit and the seven spirits cannot be taken literally as seven different spirits but has to be figurative because the literal contradicts the rest of the bible or is absurd so then figuratively, what would it mean? It's talking about word seven, perfect. It's talking about the perfect Holy Spirit. Or we could say what we see in Isaiah chapter 11, verse two, the seven fold, seven facets of the seven fold expression of the Holy Spirit. In Isaiah 11, verse two, it says, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel, spirit of might, spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. 
seven facets or sevenfold expression of the one Holy Spirit. So same one Holy Spirit is called Spirit of the Lord, that is the sovereignty of God, Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, Spirit of Wisdom, Spirit of Understanding, Spirit of Counsel, Spirit of Might, Spirit of Knowledge, Fear of the Lord. One Holy Spirit is given seven titles, sevenfold expression or seven facets to the one Holy Spirit. So in that context, he's saying seven spirits. He's saying, here's the Holy Spirit has got these seven expressions or sevenfold facets or seven dimensions to him. So he says seven spirits. So we say, when he says, from the seven spirits who are before his throne, he is most likely seeing this seven vibrant expressions of the one Holy Spirit. There he's referring to seven spirits. So let's think about an example. Suppose you take a prism, right? You disperse a ray of light coming in on one side. You see the other side and you see seven colors. What will you say? We will say, wow, seven colors. But it's one light, one ray or beam of light. But raising seven colors. Does it mean there are seven different lights? No. It's one beam of light or one ray of light. But what we are seeing are the seven, uh, literally speaking, seven colors contained in that light. Basically, if you go technical, it's seven different wavelengths that are for our natural eyes, seven different colors. But it's one light. Source is one white light dispersed. So what John is most likely seeing before the throne, this is the second of verse four, is he is seeing God the Holy Spirit, but he's seeing the sevenfold expression of who he is. One spirit, seven expressions, seven facets. And he writes down seven spirits before the throne. But actually, one God, Holy Spirit, one Spirit. Now, keep this seven spirits, this 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 uh, phrase. Actually, it's a two-word phrase. Seven spirits in mind, but make clear, make it clear that it is referring to one Holy Spirit, because in the coming chapters, the seven spirits keeps coming again. He's saying, I'm seeing seven spirits, seven spirits. But we have to understand there's only one Holy Spirit. But he is seeing the sevenfold expression of the one Holy Spirit. Is this clear to us? Any questions? Okay. Uh, so don't get confused when it's a seven spirits. Oh, no, think of the simple example, right? Light, when it dispersed, if you see or if you see the dispersion, it's seven colors, but one source, light. So what John is seeing is most likely this vibrant sevenfold expression of the one Holy Spirit. He's recording it as seven spirits. But in our interpretation or in our understanding, we have to stay consistent with the rest of the Bible. Therefore, we can only say one Holy Spirit. Okay. Yeah, I see. I see your comments in the chat. Okay, good. So, Seven spirits which are before his throne. That means, you know, this is the throne room. God the Father, the eternal one, who was or is or is to come. The Holy Spirit. Then, verse 5, 
and from Jesus Christ. So he is seeing the eternal word. He recognizes Jesus Christ because he's walked with him for three or three and a half years. I see Jesus Christ. And then he begins to um, express some attributes of Jesus Christ. Just like how he, for, about God the Father, he said, this is the one who, war, who is, who was, who is to come, meaning the eternal nature of God. About the Holy Spirit, this is a seven spirits. So there, there are seven dimensions to him. Then same thing about Jesus, from Jesus. What about, what does he say about Jesus? The faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. He mentions three things about Jesus. He's the faithful witness. That means he's a, the word witness, martyr, the one who gave his life. He's the one who, who was so faithful. He gave his life, faithful witness. He did not, he did not go, go away uh, from, uh, deviate from anything he was called to do, a faithful witness to the point of death. Faithful martyr, faithful one who gave his life. Faithful witness. The firstborn from the dead, the first person to be resurrected from the dead forever. You know, I mean, we know people were raised from the dead, but the first person to be resurrected from the dead, to live forever. And the ruler over the kings of the earth. So he's acknowledging his life, faithful witness. John was there for three and a half years. He walked with him. This Jesus Christ is the one who faithfully fulfilled his mission. He's the one who rose up from the dead. See, about 60 odd years after Christ's resurrection, a lot has happened. And John the beloved, who was there, walking with Jesus physically. 60 years later, he has not changed. This Jesus was raised from the dead. So no change. He was raised from the dead. What they said on the first day um, of the resurrection, what John saw in the garden, I mean, when he went to the empty, when he saw the tomb, the empty tomb, 60 years later, same thing. He was raised from the dead, first born from the dead. And not only that, he is the ruler over all the kings of the earth. He recognizes. He is in this great, high, exalted position, ruler over the kings of the earth. Right? So, what I'm pointing out in verses 4 and 5 is he uses the word from three times. And he's clearly expressing the triune God. God the Father, the one who is, who was, who is to come, the eternal God. God the Holy Spirit, whom he sees as seven spirits, but one Holy Spirit, God the Son the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, God the Son, or the eternal word, whom he knows very well, because he says, you know, I've seen him as a faithful witness, I've seen his raised from the dead, and today he is king over all the rulers of the earth. This is very clear, you know. And uh, then he tells us, in verse 5, he continues, you know, what, what the Lord has done for us. He has loved us, he has washed us in his own blood, and he has made us kings and priests, to God his Father. So what did Jesus do for us? John states very clearly. He loved us. He washed us from our sins with his own blood. So we embrace that. And we have been made kings and priests to God his Father. We have been brought into a special place before God. That's what he's done for us. And so he acknowledges that. And to him be glory, dominion forever and ever. And then he 
tells us, he he looks, you know, he says, okay, this is the same Jesus is going to come. Verse 7. Can somebody read verse 7, please? I think I will pick up a little speed. I'm spending too much time. Uh, let's go fast. Yeah. Verse 7. Verse 7, please. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eyes will see him, even they who pierce him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. Hmm. Now, this verse, um, Revelation 1 7, kind of parallels Zechariah 12 and verse 10. Now, John is telling us, you know, um, the Lord is going to come. He is coming in the clouds. And people are going to see him. So this is really talking about his, what we refer to as the second coming. This will be at the end of the seven-year tribulation. He is coming. And people are going to see him. And they're going to mourn because, you know, these are the ones who pierced him. And Zechariah 12.10 says the same, or a similar thing, that when the Lord returns, this is at the end of the tribulation, the Jewish people, the house of Jacob, the house of David, referring to the Jews, they will see him and they will mourn. Because they will see that this is the one whom they had rejected whom they pierced, but he will pour out on them the spirit of grace and supplication. He'll pour out on them his Holy Spirit. So John is pointing us to the coming of the Lord and he is seeing this as the Lord is going to come. People will see him and they will mourn. So verses and verse 8, uh, he hears the Lord say, this is the Lord Jesus speaking. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So, I just want to point something out here. That the Lord uses the same uh, um, the, the same words uh, you know as as God Almighty you know so so the Lord is God Almighty this is verse verse eight very clearly Jesus is saying Jesus is speaking God the eternal word saying I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end that means everything start to finish is in him, held in him, originates from him. And he's the one who is, at the, he, who is at the beginning and at the end at the same time. He's outside of time, so he sees everything, beginning to end. Alpha and Omega, beginning and ending, says the Lord, and then he uses the exact phrase that was used for God the Father, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. So what I want to point out is, this is exactly what the phrase that Jesus is using, that was used by God the Father, or for God the Father, telling us that he is co-equal with God the Father, even though, you know, just previously he was saying, and to his God and Father, that was in verse 6, that doesn't mean he's below God the Father, he's co-equal with God the Father, he's using the same phrase Alpha, Omega, beginning and ending. Who was, who is, who is to come. The Almighty, says the Lord, the Lord Jesus. Can he, and you see this once again a little later. Okay, so the Lord Jesus is co-equal with God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. In reference to his walking on the earth as the Son of God, in reference to him being the Son of God, we say, his God and his Father. That's because 
he chose to walk on the earth as the son of God. So in that context, we are saying, you know, his father, his God, but he's actually co-equal with God the Father. He is, that's Jesus, is the Lord Almighty, just as God the Father and God the Son. Verse 9, John says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John is identifying himself, who he is. He says, I'm, I'm writing this. You know, so there's no question on who wrote the book of Revelation. John affirms here. He says, look, I'm John. I'm, write, I'm writing this. And um, I'm your brother and uh, a companion in the tribulation. So... The, the tribulation, that word, the tribulation, it doesn't refer to the, the great tribulation that the church is going to go, I mean, that, that is going to happen. But he's referring to the sufferings that they were going through as a church at that time, being persecuted by the Roman emperors, right? So the Romans, so under their hand, the church, the believers were suffering. So that's the tribulation that John is referring to, right? So he says, I'm your brother. I am also suffering the same sufferings you're going through. Uh, for the kingdom of God, for the endurance of patience of Jesus Christ. And he says, I was on the island on Patmos. I've been sent there for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here that phrase testimony of Jesus means what? Because I am bearing testimony to Jesus. Right? So that's what we're seeing here, the testimony of Jesus. Verse 10, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loved voice as of a trumpet. So he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So this must have been a sun, not must have been. This was a Sunday, the first day of the week. Uh, it was uh, what, you know, the, the, the day the church set aside to meet and worship. So on that day, on one particular Sunday, he was caught up in the spirit. That means his spirit was taken up by the Holy Spirit into the spiritual realm. Into So he literally had, now what we would say, an out-of-body experience. His body was here on earth, on the island of Patmos, but the Holy Spirit took him up in the spirit to see things in the spiritual realm. So that's what he means. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. The Holy Spirit caught him up, took him out of this body into the spiritual realm. So his body was here, but the man, person on the inside, the spiritual being on the inside, which is really the real person, is now in the spiritual realm and is hearing and seeing things. What I do want to point out is he says, and I heard, I heard, who heard? The spirit person heard. I heard. So his body is here on earth, but his spirit person is up in the spiritual realm and he hears. That means our spirit person has faculties just like our human body. So the human body has five faculties. And we see that these five faculties are also mirrored with respect to the human spirit or the spiritual person. The spirit or the spirit person has similar faculties. It can hear, it can see, it can feel, it can touch, even taste or taste and see that the Lord is good, meaning it's an expression of, you know, experiencing the goodness of that spiritual thing. But here he says, I was in the spirit and I heard. So as we journey through the book of Revelation, John is going to be saying, I heard, I saw, I felt. And these are not, things in the human body. 
because his body was left on the island of Patmos. These are all expressions in relation to his human spirit, the spirit person. The spirit person is hearing, seeing, feeling, talking, having conversation. He talks to spirit beings, they talk. So you find that through the book of Revelation. Means the spirit person is very real and has all the faculties like what we are accustomed to in the human body or the human person. Okay. Are you all with me so far? And just one more point there in verse 10. We'll stop here with verse 10. He says, I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. So, this is the spiritual realm. He's now in the spiritual realm. And he's hearing sounds. He's also recognizing loudness of sound. The sound is for him, that sound that he hears in the spiritual realm, he's correlating it with the sound of a trumpet. But what is interesting is, in that sound, which sounds like a trumpet, there is a message. There are words, there is a message coming through. So, I mean, in the, in the natural, if you're hearing a trumpet sound, do you get a message? No. Has no, I mean, not unless you imagine something, but generally it's just a sound. It's, it may fluctuate in its, in its tone and loudness and whatever, but there is no message as such. There are no words coming through. But in the spiritual realm, John is saying, I'm hearing a sound. There is loudness to the sound. It sounds like a trumpet, but there's a message in it. He, you know, the next few verses are what that message was. It's the Lord speaking. What language was it? Did the Lord Jesus speak to John in Greek or what? If it was, if the Lord spoke to John in Greek, I'm just saying example, right? In the spirit, if he heard the Lord speak in Greek, he would not have said, I heard a loud voice like a trumpet. He would have most likely written, I heard a loud voice or I heard the Lord speak to me and say, but he's just recorded it as a sound of a trumpet. We don't know the language. The apostle Paul wrote, he said, you know, though I speak in tongues of men or of angels, that is, these are languages of heaven. We don't know. It sounds, uh, you know, it has sound, but then John is getting the meaning of it. He's getting an understanding of it. So what can he say? We can say that in the spiritual realm, there's a means by which spirit beings communicate. There seems to be awareness of sound, uh, we don't know what the language is. It's just not mentioned, and John wouldn't didn't say anything here. But there's a means of communication, and even sound in the spiritual realm, levels of sound in the spiritual realm. Because John said, "I heard a loud sound," and you'll see that also as we progress. You know, a loud silence in heaven. There's loud shoutings, you know, and so on. 
So there's loudness. There's a means for communication. Now we don't understand it. I'm just trying to highlight, you know, hey, we are seeing all these things concerning the spiritual realm, concerning the unseen realm. We are seeing these things. But I think a key takeaway is your spirit person has faculties and therefore as our spirit person begins to engage with God, we should know or we should be aware and we should be open to receiving communication from God in our spirit person. We don't have to be taken out of our body as in John's experience, but the fact is our spirit communes with God who is spirit. And therefore God can commune or communicate with our spirit to our spirit faculties through what we see, hear, feel, know, understand. He can communicate. Okay, this is the, uh, what to say, an aside or something we can take away and be open to. Okay, let's pause here. We'll uh, pick up from this uh, next week. Um, are, are you all with me so far? I know, I feel I'm going a little slow. I'll pick up speed. Uh, but uh, you've all been with me. Everything is clear. Any questions before we close? Okay, let's close in prayer that we'll dismiss. Um, Prince, uh, would you please close us and dismiss us in prayer, please? Thank you, Lord. Thank you in this time that we learned the, the book of Revelation, well understanding your deep revelation. Thank you what you are want to reveal us, Father. Help us to uh, go into that, Lord, and uh, apply in our daily life, Lord. Help us and make more and more on you, Lord. Thank you. I bless in this time. In Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. I will take our break. I'll see you in the next class. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, sir.